Amen. You may be seated. Shall we turn in our Bibles to Ephesians? We're going to read chapter 4, verses 9 through 16 of Ephesians chapter 4. And here we go. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we be henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, we're speaking about 14 uh, uh, plans that God has for his elect. Plans, I guess, would be the word. Fourteen areas that God has needs that God has for his, that he is going to use his elect to meet. One of my reasons for emphasizing these is that it gets our mind away from what Jesus is going to do for me and see what we're supposed to be in God's plan to meet the needs of God and of Jesus. That's one of our purposes. And the first one that we mentioned was a bride for the lamb. And we emphasize that a great deal so that you can see the importance of this and imagine how Jesus feels about it and see that it isn't just that we're trying to improve ourselves or get ourselves a rank in the kingdom but that it is for somebody else. It is for Jesus. And I guess the surest mark of growth in any human being is when he moves away from how this profits me to how it's impacting on other people. A baby is born extremely self-centered and everything is me. The baby is the center of the universe in the baby's eyes. And we all enjoy that because the baby needs help and God made it that way. But when we grow, we should be growing into an awareness of other people, you know, the way we impact on them. But some people never grow like this. They live and they die their lives and they die at the age of 70 and, it, and life has continued to be how it affects me. How it, how it is affecting me. Or in a husband and wife relationship, how you are affecting me. Now, growth, in order to grow, we've got to be able to at least intellectualize that we are impacting on other people and that they deserve consideration. And if we have a sense of fairness, and I believe we do, then we at least feel that's right, that's truth. And then God helps us. He breaks down our self-will by suffering. And as we suffer and endure and put up with things, we gain insight into other people. We're so quick to judge. I know that Aubrey and I have experienced that a great deal. I think God has brought us through many things. So that when we hear people who are hurting, that instead of coming up with a quick answer, uh, oh, you could do this if you tried, 
You say, hey, wait a minute. We've been there. We know what that's like. The mother that has nothing but perfectly healthy children, well-behaved, intelligent, quick in school, they've always gotten honors, is in no position to appreciate the mother that has a child with problems, that maybe goes wrong when they're 12 or they're 13. And the person that has the model child, it, 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 they've got the simple solution. Well, if you only did what I did, or you read the books that I read, or you listened to the tapes that I listened to, you wouldn't have had those problems. How many have been there? Ever have anybody give you advice like that? Or the person that has been healed because they exercise faith. Do you think they have any patience with the person who is sick? They say, well, if you did what I did, I just believed and God healed me. But you believed and God didn't heal you. And they're in no position to help you. But the person, I know I had a friend that wrote a book entitled, What About Those of Us Who Are Not Healed? She wrote a book on that, Carmen Benson, and it was published. What about those of us who are not healed? <laughs> that book did fine for a while, and then God did the worst possible thing he could have done. He healed her. <laughs> blew, her whole, blew her whole program. But she had a long-standing illness that she thought, and she prayed and, and, and all the things, and she wasn't healed. So she wrote a book, What About Those of Us Who Are Not Healed? Because, you know, it's not in to not be healed when you're in certain movements. That's, that's a reproach. And so she was feeling that, so she wrote the book. She's been here in this church, Carmen Benson. What about those of us who are not healed? Yeah, and then God healed her after she wrote the book. So that's the Lord's sense of humor. But it does help a lot. The parents that have a child that continually fails in school, and the teachers, you could do better if you tried. And by the time the child is 10 years old, the self-image is so defeated Especially if, his, especially if he has a brighter sibling and the mother and the father are so insensitive as to say, well, your sister always got A, what's wrong with you? Your brother always got A, what's wrong with you? Can you imagine how that child feels that wants the approval of the teachers? And in a Christian school, it's 10 times worse because then you get the feeling, God is angry with me. I'm talking about reality. I'm talking about what hundreds, maybe thousands of children experience in school and in Christian schools. And if you have a child that pulls nothing but F on his report card, you've got to admire him for being consistent. Take him down and reward him. Say, we love you, honey. There's more things in life than reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I know too, from my limited background, that some of the most lucrative uh, positions and positions of status in this world do not come to people that are bookish. One of them is the military, another one is politics, and another one is selling. They don't require bookishness, and, and some top salesmen and top politicians couldn't spell politician if their life depended on it but it called for other abilities. And so abilities that are highly esteemed in the elementary school often are not esteemed in the workaday world. And that's a fact. Your top salesman hires a secretary who can spell. That isn't where his talent is. It's in other areas, administration and things. So you learn from that to help the child in his limited environment you know, with teachers and misunderstanding adults to, to protect his ego. But you don't learn that unless you have a child with a handicap. And if your children are perfect and somebody else's child at the age of 12 has set fire to a national park and they clamp him in the pokey, say, well, you, the sneaking feelings back to the parents did something wrong. Hey, Hey, I'm talking about compassion. I'm talking about insight. I'm talking about growing up. 
and realizing that unless you've walked in those moccasins, you better not criticize the Indian, okay? Because it's been my experience that most people are doing their best. Most people are doing their best most of the time, and they do not willfully hurt other people. And you've heard me say that many times. Most people. And it's good to have that understanding if God has blessed you with a happy marriage that works perfectly, go slow. Go slowly on people that are having problems because they may have been just as well-intentioned as you, but there may be things there that you know nothing about. Amen. Oh, Brother Thompson, that was so insightful. That was such wonderful preaching this morning. <laughs> well, you have to learn something by the time you're 66 and three quarters. And that is go slow, go slow, go slow. The man that founded the Boy Scouts of America had a saying, with boys, it's easy does it. With boys, it's easy does it. There's a lot of wisdom in that. Amen? So we're growing. And one of the sure signs of growth is when we get away from me, mommy, me, mommy, me, 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 and begin to think about how other people feel, and how God feels. And so that's, we're talking now in these 14 hopes and prayers and desires and needs that God has, that we will realize that God has created us, as they used to say in years ago in the old confession of faith, that we are created for God's pleasure. Have any of you ever been in a high church where they read that in the confession of faith, that we were created for his pleasure? Any in any of the confessions or the catechism? My, that's surprising. All right. Well, number one was a bride for the Lord, and you can imagine the intensity of Christ's desire for his bride. So as we're thinking about that first of the 14 that we've mentioned, which is the end of the elect, the objective for the elect, let's project into how Christ feels about it when we flirt with other things, with demons, how he feels about it. Of course, Christ isn't jealous, is he? Huh? In all caps, as someone said this morning. In, not underline italicized, but in the King James, in all caps, my name is jealous. So it's a burning situation here. It's a real marriage. It's a real bride. And when we're looking elsewhere, it isn't just that we're being naughty. It's that Christ is burning, burning. Why doesn't she look at me? Why doesn't she look at me? Why is she looking all over the countryside? Why isn't she looking at me? And his jealousy burns and it's something to think about. <laughs> then we come to the second of these 14 functions, which is the body of the Messiah. And we're talking about that in our reading, or what does he ascended mean in verse 9 of Ephesians 4? We're passing now to this second of the 14 purposes in the elect, the body. It's interesting to note that no one except the Apostle Paul used the term, the body of the Messiah. You will not find it in the Old Testament, and you will not find it in the New Testament except for the Apostle Paul. And it's a never-ending astonishment to me, reading the Bible, how God will entrust so much to one person. <clears throat> And you know that's true in your life. God has something for you that is a, a hinge on which so many, many things depend. Be faithful in the little things. Be faithful in the little things. That's so important. If you are, 
They'll become big things someday. Despise not the day of small beginnings, it says in Zechariah 4. Well, if I were a big preacher, I'd pray and I'd really get with it. But all I've got is some little thing. God says, what is that in your hand? That's what he said to Moses. What is that in your hand? It became a great thing in Moses' hand when he came in the court of Pharaoh. It ceased to be a staff and became the sign of God. And every one of us has something in his hand. And we think, oh man, if I were like, you know, Earl Roberts, or if I were bishop of the Methodist church, if I were this or that, oh man, would I serve God. But God has given you something in your hand. And, and he watches to see how faithful you are with it. I mean, it can be a very small thing. Pray like you are the greatest apostle that ever lived on that small thing. It could be a little child. It could be any number of things that's in your little environment. But there is no <laughs> member of the body that is dead, that is sterile. No member of the body that is not viable. Everything in the body has a purpose. And every purpose is as important as every other purpose. Whether it's visible to men or not makes no difference. Get a feeling for the importance of what you're doing. Get a feeling for the importance of what you're doing. If you're called to be a saint, you have the highest calling in the universe. And how you deal with the talent. Some people have ten, some five, some one. That's not the issue, it's what you do with it. I was asked not so long ago by the brass in our local denomination when I plan to retire. I said, when I'm, I said, they didn't hear me. I said, I'm, when I'm 101, I'm really going to start serving the Lord. So they wrote down, he's going to retire at 101. I consider what I'm doing in boredom. And I can't imagine laying down saying, oh, I'm 65 now, so I'll quit. I can't even conceive of it. Well, what you're doing is just as important as what I'm doing. And if you don't believe it, then you've got a problem. It is. It is. How seriously are you taking what you do? That's the concept of a body. Well, you say, well, inside in my, uh, you know, I've got a little flipper flopper in there. That isn't all that important, you know. It isn't. It isn't. You let something go wrong with it. That little flipper flopper in your gizzard somewhere that you don't even know the name of it. Kathy Borman knows its name, but you don't. And something goes wrong with it. You'll be in there being ministered to by Kathy. You never saw it. You never heard of it. And you don't know its Latin name. But if it malfunctions, all your beautiful physique and appearance will find itself supine on the white sheets of a hospital bed. While the doctors fuss about this little thing. Helen Johnson there could probably tell you all the minute hormones in the body, and there are many, and most of them know, uh, we may know one or two. We may have heard of adrenaline. How many have heard of adrenaline? How many have heard of cortin? Well, uh, adrenaline's important, but so is cortin, which is secreted, I believe, from the cortex. Uh, is that right, Helen, of the kidneys? I think that's where cortin comes from. And there are a number of other trace minerals, trace hormone. We've got more nurses here this morning. I'm leaving out Mary. Mary, you could tell us a thing or two. These are minute things, and every once in a while, uh, somebody doesn't have enough of them, or they get too much of them. And I mean, you've got big problems. Is that right, Mary? 
But you know, but people when they uh, when they introduce, you know, you don't you don't uh, see all these uh, hormones or anything. You know, you see their face. Now you might note the color of their eyes if you're observant. Shake their hand. Uh, but uh, all of this doesn't work if one of those hormones goes awry. Tiny thing. So one of them could say, yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not the body, I'm not the nose, I'm not the ear, so I'll just quit functioning. And what happens? <laughs> Bad news. There's another one we know about in your pancreas. What is that one there? Insulin. Huh? We could take insulin. Doesn't work. You've got problems. And when you meet somebody, ordinarily, you know, you're not notably impressed with the way that their pancreas is functioning. <laughs> but if it quits functioning, <laughs> you better pay attention to what you eat and how often you eat and a number of other things. Well, that's what Paul is telling us. And that's why I rage and roar about the pastor clergy laity Thing because for so many hundreds of years it has destroyed the feeling of importance, the feeling of clerical stature of the members of the body. It has destroyed that. It has introduced the idea that, well, that, that we've got a good preacher and he prays and he works hard and he does this and he does that. While I retire, you are important. If you're a member of the body of the Messiah, you have a function, and it's terribly important, and you don't go on vacations. Hey, listen, I'm going to preach about that. Because I feel more happily concerned about that now because Audrey and I didn't take a vacation for something like 40 years, and then, so we started in every once in a while, taking a couple of days and nights off. And also, I, I feel now like that I can say this without any sense of extremism because uh, we need it. We need to get away sometimes, but we can't hear the phone. Don't you think that's lovely? Hasn't worked yet. We've been called, I think, each time we've been away, but we're cooking on it. Okay? It certainly has brought it down to a minute. Oh, we just get away and do nothing. Read. We're both readers. Okay? But I tell you, there's no vacation in our house unless we're sure that that's what God wants. It doesn't come up by the calendar because it's seasonal, because it's summer or winter or anything. We know that that's the Lord's will because if we left out of the Lord's will, I do believe Armageddon would take place. June one time stayed at our house and she says, this place is a battle zone. <laughs> well, how come your house isn't a battle zone? You don't just do like everybody else. You say, Lord, do you want me to take a vacation? Lord, do you want me to retire? Lord, what do you want me to do, Lord? I've got this in the body, and I feel it's as important as anybody else in the body. And Jesus, I, I'm in this thing for keeps. I want to know, Lord, help me to do your will. Hey, come on. Huh? Summer's here. That doesn't mean, you know, that you uh, wait till fall. To serve the Lord. You better not, because I tell you, the heat's on. And if you don't pray voluntarily, guess what? We're in Ephesians 4. <laughs> what does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended. Well, you can't. How many know you can't ascend till you descend? Well, that's what he's talking about. You can't repeat until you peat. You know, there's some things like that that just work like that. Are you there? Uh, that you took that laying down, didn't you? <laughs> All right. He also descended to the lower earthly regions. And scholars have believed that, uh, that Samuel and the others were in the earth. We know Samuel's in the earth. And that at least part of the earthly domain that was within the earth, when the Lord rose, he took up with him. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens... He ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Hallelujah. Stan, that's the galactic Christ. He fills the whole universe. Was he who gave some to be apostles? How many would like to be an apostle? 
That's a good way to become the garbage can of the universe. Some to be prophets. Oh, I'd like to be a prophet, would you? Which of the prophets have they not stoned? Huh? Oh, well, you don't have to get nasty about it. Some to be evangelists. There's an old saying, uh, if a man's evangelist, his wife, he's happy and his wife is miserable. If he's a pastor, he's miserable and his wife is happy. Do you believe that? That's an old saying. All right. Some to be pastors and teachers. Now, there's been extensive teaching on this that there's five ministries. But in, in my typology, there are only four, and, I, and the four bars around the tabernacle. In the long one, I think, is Christ, etc., and so on. So if you any, hear anybody say that there are five ministries, don't dispute with them. But the punctuation kind of suggests that there are four, that pastors and teachers are one ministry, if you'll notice the punctuation. All right, however that may be. Anyway, in the Bible, four is the number of communication. Four is the day on which God made the lights. Four is the number of the lampstand, etc., and so on. However that may be. And now, I wanted to call your attention to something else while we're talking about the gifts and ministries. In no other place does Paul outline four or five discrete ministries. In 1 Corinthians 12, he says, apostles, prophets, tongues, healing, like this. He changes the categorizing altogether. Now, it did become fashionable some 20 or 30 years ago when the latter rain was breaking to, to uh, enumerate these as very, very specific ministries, all of the things were gifts, and attempt to structure the church. But there is, there is not foundation for this in no other place. Rather, Paul treats that there's this kind of thing. There are apostles, for example, and there are prophets, for example, and then there are gifts of healing, and then there are faith. So I'm, I'm not into this making a big to-do about this. The point that Paul is making here the, the theme of the body of the Messiah runs throughout Ephesians. That theme runs throughout Ephesians. You remember in chapter 2, you've got the uh, one new man, and, uh, and, in the, and this chapter begins with there's one spirit and one baptism and so on. And, this, and then uh, that is um, chapter 4 begins that way. That's right. And, and you'll find it in other places in Ephesians, this idea of the body being one, being Jewish and Gentile, being one new man, being one temple of God is a theme. So what he's saying here, this is not the institution of church government. That's not where Paul's going here. He's saying that he gave these things, but he's not stressing what he gave. He's stressing the product, which is the body. So I, I have not gone into this where the brethren have really tried to lay out the thing in church government. I've to me, that's a very great bondage. What is important here is the body and that it's one. If you notice back in the beginning of the chapter, I urge you to give a life. He said there's one body, one spirit in verse 4. One, just as you were called. That's what he's saying. There's the body. The body's in his mind. He's not saying, now I'm going to set up church government for you. But that was very fashionable some years ago and in some places I think still is. All right. And now he says, <clears throat> uh, to, uh, he gave these things, and in 1 Corinthians 12, he lists others and puts them in the same category, not in a different category, but talents, things given to people. And then he says, the reason to prepare God's people for works of service. And these works of service are the things that we have uh, enumerated in times past the royal priesthood, the rulership of the world, the judges of men and angels. This, these are the works of service as well as ministry to the body itself that are the reason for the gifts. Now, the gifts, by and large, began to be restored in the late 40s. Uh, Harold Horton and Donald G. were outstanding writers in those days that introduced to the church at large, the Pentecostal church at large, the concept that God, that the gifts were for today. Now, the evangelicals up to that time had said that the gifts are not for, they are not for today. 
They, and they use uh, 1 Corinthians 13, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. So they said the gifts, including tongues, and the apostolic ministry, and all these are not for today. That was uniform teaching until Harold Horton and Donald G. and others began to say, hey, wait a minute. Hey, wait a minute. Where's your Bible for that? Well, 1 Corinthians 13, isn't the Bible perfect? Yes. Well, that which is perfect has come. That's called a syllogism. Uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. When you read 1 Corinthians 13, it's not talking anything about the Bible coming at all, whatever. And certainly the Bible's perfect. A lot of other things are perfect too, but that doesn't mean that because we have them, we need, how many know we need the gifts of the Spirit more today than we ever have? But you see, in those days, in the 40s, to say a thing like that in the church, why you get yourself booted out of the church? See how far we've come, just in 40 years, how far we've come in 40 years that I can say a thing like that. And you say, of course. Let me tell you, when I was going to Bible school, he didn't say a thing like that. He said, there are no apostles today. Tongues is not for today. That which is perfect has come. Divine healing is not for today. Did you know I used to say that? How far we've come in 40 years. You say, well, of course they're for today. It takes time. And somebody has to pioneer these things and bear the reproach of the gospel. But we've, we've, this has come this far. Now what has happened since they have come. That's amazing. We flop out of one pit into another. They have come, but they have become an occasion for self-centeredness. See, that you go to the church. Wouldn't you like to have the gift of prophecy? Oh, yeah. Why? Well, you know, man, you know, I get up in the church and do this kind of thing. See? So now we have to take another conceptual leap and realize that the purpose of these gifts is not so we'll be one of them or not so that we'll look good in the assembly or people will think we're spiritual. They have an altruistic purpose. They're out here. They're doing something. They're going somewhere. I can remember when we used to have messages in tongues. Well, I, I, I had a hard time getting the baptism, but I admired the guys. In the, we had one guy named G, Jimmy Cagle who has died since then, and he would give messages in tongues. And some would interpret. I admired him. I thought that man, you know, he just lived on Mount Sinai as far as I was concerned to think that anybody could give a message in tongues, which he did consistently. And somebody would interpret. I was more impressed with the messages in tongues. Well, finally the day came when I felt a stirring inside to give a message in tongues. Well, I was so scared that I had no, no awareness of anything around me at all. I mean, when I felt that, you know, I'd work on it, work on it, work on it, and I would stand and just explode, regardless of what was going on any other place. No one had taught me there was a purpose in it. I thought that was a sign of spirituality. And uh, we had a graduation at Sixth and Fur at the First Assembly of God downtown. It used to be at Sixth and Fur. The Bible school students, the graduates were up on the platform and there was, oh, a great crowd of people. There were ministers from all over the Assembly of God district here in Southern California. And one of, the, one of the very portentous ministers had come up to the pulpit. And I'm sitting there cooking on this thing like this. You know, this is my moment. I mean, there's a lot of people here. And I wasn't aware of what he was doing or who was in town, much less the body of the Messiah or anything else. But I was just waiting. Do I have what it takes to explode at this time? Well, people told me what happened. I didn't see it because I was so wrapped up in myself that I wasn't aware of what he was doing. But they tell me that what happened was the man got up to speak and he raised his hand to speak like that and I blew up. <laughs> well, that yeah, it's kind of embarrassing. I think about it. But the Lord, I guess, you know, we get a gift. I haven't seen that kind of thing in this church. Somehow we've kind of glided into a certain poise and understanding of what's going on. But it does help us when we have a gift. And I hope God restores all kinds of things to this church. I think we're right for it. We want it. And I think we will if we present our bodies a living sacrifice and are following the Lord. I believe they will be restored. And what we need to realize is that these there's a purpose behind the gifts. There's a purpose here. God is doing something. They are not signs of spiritual life or 
or spirituality or anything else. And he tells us about them here. He says, so that the body of the Messiah, literally in the Greek, it's ha, what is it? Ha, what is it, Tony? The Messiah. Messias. Ha, Messias. So that the body of the Messiah. People, do you realize? Do you realize the magnitude of that saying? Israel has been waiting for 2,000 years for Messiah. When Messiah comes, when Messiah comes, you know, everything will be great. But the Messiah came, but what came out was the head. What came was the head. The rest of the Messiah is being made. The anointed deliverer, the one who will bring justice and peace to the earth, the Messiah. When Messiah comes, I think the church by and large is, we don't say Messiah, we say Jesus or Christ. I, I still don't think we have a true concept of what is going to happen. The whole Messiah is coming. The head and the body, we are being made that which is going to come, that the Jews and the church is looking for, is being made. And you know, it hasn't been made too much through the centuries, I guess, except for some notable exceptions, because the body has not been functioning. It has been an institution. It has been something that you go to and a priest ministers to you and he goes through the formula and uh, you go home and that's it. But the concept of the body of the Messiah, I think even to this day is not being preached with anywhere near the significance and the importance and the intensity. Some people had a vision some years ago and they saw a giant and he was asleep and he had no head. And he slowly, this is all oh, maybe 20, 30 years ago. Anybody ever read that vision that went around? It was very popular at the time. You read it, Joy? And he began to shake himself. He began to arise. This tremendous giant in the earth stood up in his majesty. And as he did, the head began to come down. That's what Isaiah is talking about when it says, A nation shall be born in a day. It has taken 2,000 years to, be, to restore that which was lost in the first century. It's been coming back an inch at a time. The Joshua lived by faith, the priesthood of the believer, the born-again experience, water baptism by immersion, the holiness message, and then finally in the middle of the last century, the concept of the coming of the Lord at the turn of the century, Pentecost. Then in the middle of the century, the concept of uh, that the tongues was for the whole church and God wanted to restore the gifts and, and ministries and the laying on of hands and prophecy was restored in the middle of this century. But where God is going, where God is going is the concept of the one body of the Messiah. That's what's new. That's what's hot. That's what's on the growing edge is that all this that is happening to us, where we have our own little valley of acorns and our own home and our own tragedies and our own being heaped under a pile of stones and all these things, has a larger purpose. It's not just to get us through this world safely. It's because God is building what the world is waiting for and what the Jews are waiting for. God is building it. And it's out here. It's, it's altruistic. It's not locked up in how it's going to benefit us. It's that the mankind is waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And the Messiah cannot come until it is built. And the Messiah is being built today. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Do you see it? There's a larger purpose in your life. There's something up here. If the grass doesn't get mowed, it isn't going to change the history of the world, okay? But if you don't give your attention to both receiving and giving, yes, it will affect the world. It's enormously important. It's enormously important what you do, how you spend your time, how you regard your talent, how you regard your place in the body is enormously important because it is through you that all of us are built up. You say, well, I don't have anything. You do. You do. You're giving. Every time you come to the church, 
You give something. It comes from your personality. You remember it says when they were building the tabernacle of the congregation. It says people brought the things out of their tent. They brought the blue. They brought the scarlet, the gold, the bronze, all that was needed, the silver. It says every man brought out of his tent. And the tabernacle, which is a type of the Messiah, was constructed. And we still, I can tell, we still are somewhat lacking in that concept. Now, I know there's times people can't come to church, and I'm the last person. I'm too proud to ask people to come to church. That's my, one of my main problems is I'm too proud to ask people to come to church. On the other hand, I know that when you do not come, that you suffer and the body suffers. It is not a thing to take casually. This is not Mickey Mouse. It's not a denominational program. It's not something that will benefit this church per se, this building or this denomination. That is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the eternal plan of God. And he has kept it until the time of the maturing of the tares. Now the tares are beginning to mature. You know, I had a, a, a thought the other day. What is going on in America? See, when we executed this man, Mr. Harris, we got a bad press from Europe and from Mexico. They, and I got to thinking about that. Uh, the Mexican uh, press said we had resorted to barbarism. Uh, the, from Europe came noises that it was obscene. What we had done was obscene. You know, it's just not civilized. That's the way we look to Europeans. They're so much deeper into sin and real deep sin than we are or ever will be that it's pitiful. Nevertheless, the press felt free to say that what we had done was obscene. And I, I got to thinking about that. And I may be incorrect. I don't read European newspapers, but I doubt that they have any kind of lineup in death row of people doing the things that have been done in America. I think they're very rare. The Jack the Rippers are not as common in England as they are in America from what I see. And then I began to ponder, why is that? that why is America so savage? Well, the, the, if you read the record of the recent uh, men that are on death row, the next ten in line, and see what they've done, is, I mean, it's, it warrants the death penalty. In my opinion, it certainly warrants it. But I don't think, I haven't seen that from Europe that there's this kind of barbarism that goes on by people. Now, I'm, uh, some of you may correct me on that. But I think the reason for it is this. America, America is a microcosm. Did you realize that? America is a microcosm of the one world government. There's no other nation that is not a race. Only America is an amalgam of different races. And as a result, when you go in other countries, whether it's India or Iceland or these places that I have been, or Germany and so on, Czechoslovakia, you will find that people have a sense of national pride. This is very strong in Iceland. Their national greeting is blesseth, which means bless you. The Christian influence is so strong. I mean, an Icelander is an Icelander. You know, whatever else he may be, he's still our brother. He's still an Icelander. You follow me? He's still an Icelander. You go over to Scotland or Ireland or any place like that, or Britain or Germany. This man is my brother. He's a German. But we have a microcosm. We have a prototype going called the American Experiment, which is if you could get all the races of the world to join together under a constitution that stressed democracy, this is an experiment. It's a microcosm of a one world government. And, as, and whenever you put pressure on the United States, what happens is each group flees to its own. The blacks go to the blacks, and the Mexicans go to the Mexicans, and the English, they, the pressure causes the, the melting pot to cease to be a melting pot. So we've come into what, it, we've changed from the melting pot that we learned 40, 50 years ago in school to what is called multicultural. We've given up on the idea of the, mul of the melting pot. This is a tremendous sociological change that we never voted in, but came about in the course of events. Now what is happening is that people don't feel responsible for other people. So America, if it's finding its place in the Bible, 
It's probably somewhere over as a forerunner of the beast. We have got bad problems in sociology and in morality in this country. Bad problems. I don't know whether you recognize that or not, but the jails are popping at the seams and the things keep getting worse and more bizarre and more demonic. Or am I incorrect? Mm. Or are you numb to it already? Huh? Do you realize what goes on in the paper today if it were viewed 40 years ago? People wouldn't even believe it, but we get numb. It keeps happening and we think, oh, well, he only killed 10 people. I mean, you know, let him off. Well, we got to get, it's the guy that killed 300. You get numb, numb. Oh, here's a young lady and he hacked both her arms off. Well, you know, so what's new? Well, 40 years ago, that would have been, un, you know, it would have practically stopped the country. Today, it's just one more attic in California. Okay? Why am I saying this? Because God says where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. God knew this darkness was coming. He knew this incredible barbarism, and it is barbarism. Not barbarism putting them to death, it's, it's barbarism that happened. It's barbarism. Shooting the arms off a, a young fella and then laughing at him and then eating his lunch. I don't know what you want to call it, okay? And I realize that there are things that cause this. I'm not judging anybody. Whenever anybody does anything wrong, there are things that caused it. You know, God knows that. You put him to death, maybe God can do something with him in the spirit realm. But God told us clearly in the Bible, whoever takes man's life by man shall his life be taken. God is wise and loving far more than we are. He knows what's good, but that's not my place to solve. What I'm trying to tell you is, it is people, it is not, Business as usual, okay? You, you know, the prophecies came forth this morning, and it's so true. It takes a while to get through our head. We think, well, you, know, you know, my family's going along, and all of a sudden, my family isn't going along. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean everything I believed up to this time is wrong? Does that mean I'm missing God? Does that mean the end of the world has come on me and everybody else is getting to watch their TV? How do I orient myself to the tragedy in my household? Do you see what I'm saying? And if it isn't in your household, it'll get there soon enough. Be concerned about somebody else. Your turn is coming. God is not mean. He is not harsh. We're not talking about doomsday. We're talking about the body of the Messiah and God's plan. And the only way it can be constructed is as you and I are brought down to the ends of ourselves in the valley of Achor, which is our hope that we'll be raised again in Jesus and be part of his appearing. And in the meanwhile, the gifts and ministries are to keep us going, to give us revelation, to comfort us, to strengthen us, to minister the word of God to us so that we make the transition from the Adamic soulish life into the life of the Spirit of God. People living in the, the, the natural, in, in the fleshly life, cannot partake in the body of the Messiah. They're good people, love God, decent, honorable, God-fearing people. That's not the body of the Messiah. The body of the Messiah is supernatural, it's born of God. It comes through supernatural gifts and ministries, but it's accompanied by distress on us because when we don't have it, we don't get poured from vessel to vessel. We don't get broken up till we're brought to the ends of ourselves. Well, you know, we, we say prayers and we're real religious and everything, but when it gets hard enough, we say, God, help me. I'm at my wit's end. Do something, Lord. I'm going down. And it's at that point when God can get the body and blood of his son down into you and his spirit into you and your word, and you are changed. Getting religion isn't changed. That's just that you have ascended to decent moral things. That's not change. Change comes about through crisis. The radical things that we need to turn come about as we're brought down to our wit's end because otherwise we fight to save our life and we succeed. I mean, we can be sick, have bankrupt and everything and still manage to hang on until God breaks us down to the place where we say, I can't handle this anymore, Lord. 
you know, I played my nice religious game and I thought I had it and everything, but I am really in a terrible state here, my father, and I need your help. When you get down there, that, that allows and makes possible God's intervention into your personality. So in it, Jacob gives us the story. Jacob gives us the story. The old supplanter. He was so religious. The man, they had gods around. and Plus, he had his father's God and his mother's God and his dream about the ladder to heaven and all this. He was a religious man. As soon as he came back on the way, here came the angels to meet him. As soon as he left Haran, here they came, Machanaim, the, the double camp, came to meet him. He's a man of God, one of the men after whom God calls himself. I am the God of Jacob. But oh, Jacob wasn't chained. He was still figuring the moves. He was keeping his life. Now let me see. I'll put these out. I'll put these out. I'll put these out. Somehow God get me out of this mess. After cheating his brother, after cheating his father-in-law, who in turn cheated him, Brother, sister, that Jacob, which his name means supplanter. His name be, means supplanter. He's every one of us. Every one of us. And he came to the end of himself and he crossed Jordan. And Jordan represents death to self. That self-will that we're born with. That thing that'll fight like a cornered rat to hold on to its ability to make religion serve its own ends. He wrestled all night, brother, sister. You don't wrestle in the daytime. It'd be nice if you could, but it's when everything is dark. Man, if you've got it in you, you'll stay with it. You won't quit. You'll stay with it long past your ability to do anything. You just won't quit. It'll, and it'll bring out of you things you never knew. Where there, you'll find your name there. You'll find your name there. That's when religion and everything and all your hopes and dreams and, and the nice religious actions and all the rest of it and the opinions of people and everything just go away in the flood. Your religious pride, everything. And you find yourself struggling with God and asking after his name, who are you anyway? I thought I knew you. My father told me all about you. My mother told me all about you. The pastor told me all about you. But who are you? I don't recognize this. That's what's coming to you if you're going to be a member of the body. It has to come. For your good, it has to come. As long as he was the supplanter, he was no good. God could not call himself, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and a supplanter. No, it's going to happen to you. And, and, and it's your door of hope. It's your door of hope. When you hit the bottom, it's your door of hope. It's there. God will marry you, and it's there he'll change from uh, Baal, Lord, to Ishi, my husband. That's where the marriage takes place, is in the bottom of the heap of stones. And he wrestled all night. And you know, there was reality in this man, this Jacob, that had not had a chance to show itself to this point. There's a reality in you and me that doesn't get to show itself until we come to the moment of truth. It doesn't get to show In fact, we don't even know ourselves what we're like, what we'll do under enough pressure. Something he had it. He had it. It ran deeper in him than all this ability to trick and scheme and get himself out of trouble. It ran deeper in him than that. And he said, I won't let you go. How long won't you let me go? I won't let you go, period. I'm not letting you go. The day is breaking. I've got to get out of here. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Boy, when you hang on like that, I tell you, it's long past your ability to scheme and plan and outwit people. It's way past that. And God blessed him. God blessed him. He knew the stuff was there, but he wanted Jacob to see it. And God touched him. Why did God hurt him? God hurt him. 
He didn't come out of there like he went in. A strong man, a man's strength is in his legs, whether it's boxing or golf or whatever it is. <laughs> strength comes from your legs, maybe not in tiddlywinks, but in other things it comes from your legs, and that's where God touched him, was in his thigh, wounded him. And he came out of there limping. He was no longer Jacob, the proud, the assertive. He's a very strong man. He got so excited when he saw Rachel that here was the stone there waiting for a whole bunch of guys to come to move the stone away from the well. Jacob went up and he took a look at Rachel and he went up and moved it by himself. He was very strong and somewhat inspired. But he's different now. I've known him. I've seen him. He knew the Holy One of Israel, the fire of Israel. I wrestled with him, kids. I wrestled with him. Judah and Levi and Simeon. I wrestled with him. The Mighty One, the God of my father, Isaac. I wrestled with him, and he touched me. He hurt me, but I have seen him, the living God. I wrestled with him. And I prevailed. It's going to happen to you. Don't expect anybody to understand. They won't. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about the body of the Messiah. Coming to know the Lord. Thy name shall no more be called Jacob. And yet afterward he referred to himself. He doesn't refer to himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. But he kept the name Jacob, Yaakov, Avraham, Tzach, Yaakov. And you know why? Because even though God brings you down to the dust and hurts you and teaches you to fear God and to know him and to realize his almightiness and that you're really a worm and nothing at all, in spite of that, God saves what you are. He, he kept on being Jacob. Just when you think everything's gone, nothing's left for me, and God brings you out of the fire, behold, it's still you. Maybe you could wish it weren't, but it's still you. It's still Jacob with a lot to learn. And that's the way God does with people. They think that God's out to destroy them. God's not out to destroy us or any desire that is wholesome or anything that is right about our life, none of it is going to be destroyed. Remember that. Nothing that is worthwhile in your life will be destroyed. In the moment when you meet God in your moment of truth, and it's all over, and all that you had hoped for and planned for, and you've been so happy in your religious life, and now it's gone, and it doesn't seem like it'll ever be retrieved, let me tell you something. You'll come out of it. It's not a grave. It's a tunnel. You'll come out of it. And when you do, you feel yourself all around. It's all there. You haven't lost a thing. But you've gained the knowledge of the holy. The world is waiting for the body of the Messiah. It's not waiting for you and me. It's not waiting for religious people that know all the ways of the churches. It's waiting for the expression of God, of Christ. The Jewish people are not waiting for a bunch of Gentile dogs that call themselves Christians and have hated them for 2,000 years. The Jews are not waiting for that. They're waiting for the Anointed One, the Holy One of God. They're waiting for God, God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. It's only as we marry him and as he invades us and changes us and as we become part of him and live by his body and live by his blood, it's only then that Israel, God's people, will look up and say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. This is the presence of God to us. Praise the Lord. Shall we stand?
We've talked about some things this morning that are important. Judging, being willing to serve God in the hour of trial, not giving up, hoping when we're under a pile of stones. We've talked about something extremely important, that is that we take what we do in Christ seriously and not treat it as though we're still in the old church world and we're going to go through our thing and then retire. And, uh, you know, everybody's going to come to our funeral and sing safe in the arms of Jesus. All that is evil and dark is rearing up its head in America. And three points and a conclusion are not going to affect it. Not going to save us when our family's under enormous pressure. We need to make sure that we are really giving it our best shot. And if you're here this morning, and you're a little too casual about your ministry, your place, I invite you to come this morning and tell the Lord, it's history. From now on, I'm going to treat this business with the significance and the importance and the intensity that it deserves. If you're here this morning, I invite you to come now. In the name of Jesus, the Messiah. Hallelujah.